All right. We want to um, greet everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're grateful to the Lord for everyone that's here today. Is everything fine? All right. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, let's go to the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew. The sixth chapter of the book of Matthew. We're going to talk to you about a few things today, just real briefly. Um, again, uh, one of the things that we want to point out to you is that whenever we are living for the Lord, uh, we have to uh, get things in order, and we have to do things in order. Uh, if we don't, then none of the rest of it will make sense. Uh, when we were in the third grade, we did not learn calculus. We learned multiplication, and we learned a little bit of division. Uh, that was to prepare us for what was coming down the road. And so whenever we, um, so is it, it's the same thing. Uh, when we're learning the things of God, uh, we have to get first things first. And if we don't, then the rest of it will not make sense to us at all. And uh, and so we have to um, make sure that we put these things in order. What did I say? Turn to the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew. Now, I wanted to bring that up again because this is at the beginning of the Lord's ministry. And he's teaching his disciples. And so he has to teach them these elementary things first before he sends them out and commissions them to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out devils and do things like that. They have to get these things first. And oftentimes, um, people, they, they try to serve God and they really try to commit their life to the Lord and they, they miss something. Maybe it's something they didn't like to hear or didn't want to hear or maybe it's just something that they're not thinking about. And because of that, then it makes living for God in their minds harder than what it really is in real life. And so here we're going to uh, go over some elementary things and, and listen, and we've gone over these things before, uh, but if you don't get this, then the rest of living for God won't make sense to you. you, you, you you'll be struggling when you uh, uh, should not be struggling. So the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew, we're going to start reading at verse 19. And I want you to notice that these scriptures, this teaching, comes right after the Beatitudes, or what we call the Beatitudes. In other words, the right attitudes, or the attitudes to have to be a, a believer. And so he starts off, you know, in his ministry, first thing he talks about is the Beatitudes. In other words, this is the way you should look at things, and this should be your attitude towards things. And this is kind of, this message here uh, that he's teaching now is kind of a continuation of what he started off teaching. Now, this, he's, what he's doing is he's laying a foundation so that when he starts teaching other things, it will make sense to them. And does everybody understand now? So you think about it this way. If... Um, you give somebody a ride, and you tell them, uh, I can only go a mile with you. And, but the, the place that they're telling you about is 10 miles away. It won't make sense to you. I'm only going a mile with you. I'm only going to take you a mile. And they say, yeah, but that, that uh, Walmart is 10 miles away. You know, if you, if you look, you'll see it. It's got the big sign out front, and it's right next door to a gas station right across the street from a laundromat and I say well that, and you may say well that don't make any sense to me I don't know where that is I don't care I'm only going a mile with you I'm only taking you a mile and, and so here we talk about Walmart and beyond but if you told the Lord I'm only going a mile with you if you don't understand the foundation first then it won't make sense to you and and so here God himself is laying a foundation in the lives of people. What it's going to take to live for him, 
so that when I'm asking you to do other things, it won't seem like it's that big of a deal to you. It's just you've already done the, the utmost. And so that, that is the problem. Jesus said, if any man is going to um, be my disciple, let him first deny himself, then take up his cross and follow me. If you're going to be my disciple, number one, deny yourself. Number two, take up your cross. In other words, not only do you have to deny yourself, but you have to choose this life of suffering that's going to come with living for me. And then even after that, you still have to follow me. Now, he said, uh, he used the term disciple because a lot of people claim to be disciples, but they're not following God. They have not denied themselves. They're their own disciple. I follow my own mind. I got my own thought about things. So that makes you your own disciple. But he said, if you're gonna, if you're gonna follow me, if, you, if you're gonna come after me, you're gonna have to, listen, choose the same discipline that I have. Now that's what a disciple is. You have the same discipline. Does everybody see that now? All right, so here, in the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew, we're gonna start reading at verse 19. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now that's the truth, if nothing else it is. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, where is my treasure? Everybody in their mama that's claiming to serve God will say, well, the Lord is my treasure. Everything, you know, the things of the kingdom, that's my treasure. But then the question is, where is your heart? Are you serving God with your whole heart? What is it in your life that get in the way of you serving God? And I can tell you that's where your treasure is. Then he goes on to say, The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters. Everybody see that now? Now, apparently, we're preaching this again after we just talked about this a couple of weeks ago because somebody's missing it, and the Lord is trying to wake you up and get your attention. You can't serve two masters. God have created you to have single vision. One of your eyes isn't going this way, and the other one's going that way. One of your eyes is not in front of you, and the other one's pointed behind you. They're pointing in the same direction because he intends for you to walk one way. So in in him saying that, he's saying, so you can't serve two masters. Look what he says there. Verse 22, let's back up to that. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, now look at what that says, single and evil. So he's saying if your eye is single, in other words, you got your eyes are where they're supposed to be, then things will work out the way they're supposed to. But if your eye be evil, in other words, you crisscrossing, serving God, serving mammon, serving God, serving mammon, serving God, serving mammon, then what does he say there? Thy whole body shall be full of darkness. In other words, there's no such thing as I'm going to serve God and I'm going to serve a little bit of mammon over here. You're serving all of mammon and trying to pretend that you're serving God. But with God, it's one way or the other. It's not you partially serving him and then turning around and worshiping money. It's one way or the other. Either you're doing it all for God or you're doing it all for mammon, but you're not doing both. You're not part-time on two jobs. Everybody see that now? It says, therefore, the light that is in thee be darkness. How great is that darkness? Everybody see that? If the light that's in thee be darkness. Now he said it that way for a reason. He's talk, he said light because that's what you think it is. 
So, of course, you know as well as I do that light and darkness are not the same. But he's saying if the light that's in you is darkness, then how great is that darkness? In other words, he said, if you're an individual that's deceived, then you're worse than somebody that's not. How great is that darkness? That's a great darkness. It's one thing to be in the dark. It's another thing to be deceived into it and thinking that you're serving light. That's what he's saying here, see. Verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Everybody see that now? Now Let's think about what he's saying there. If you serve mammon, then there's no way in the world you can even like God. You either hate him or despise him. There is no, I'm getting along with God or we cordial. If you're serving mammon, you either hate him or you despise him. You can pick and choose which one, whichever one you think is the lightest. But there's no such thing as serving mammon and still being in good with God. And he's trying to, that's what I, I love about when the Lord preaches. He laid the line down and he makes it clear to us why there is a heaven and a hell and not a purgatory. Because you're on one side or the other. There is no in-between. There is no lukewarm. Does everybody understand that now? You're on one side or the other. So he tells us what the attitude is if we're serving mammon. Uh, we're trying to serve two God. Then he tells us, ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now, you know, a lot of people don't think about that. But you cannot serve God and mammon. And the, the key word there is serve. What's more important to you? Who's more important to you? Is God more important to you than making money? You know, and that's, that's, a, that's a, 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 de- a deceptive term, making money. You're not making money. Money's making you if you're serving it. It's turning you to, into a monster. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, if God have any love for you at all, he'll never let you get ahead serving mammon. I feel sorry for people that go to hell rich because it, it can only mean one thing. God's hand didn't reach out to grab you and touch you the way it may have other people. If God allow you to go to hell rich, <laughs> that means you were way beyond his reach a long time ago. Because if God loves you and you serving mammon, he's going to make sure you ain't got enough of it to bow down to. You'll never be able to dig your feet down the way you'd like to. You'd never have enough. And he'll, he'll even let it come to your hand, but it'll slip right out of there. Next month, you won't know what you had. You know, the old people used to tell us, you know, that the old people, uh, when I was growing up, they spoke wisdom to us. And, and they would tell us, you got the money spent before you even got it. You, you can't keep money because it's spent before you get it in your hands good. You already got planned out everything that you're going to buy. And then wonder why you can't get ahead. You, you better think about it. Who is it giving you those thoughts? Could it be God leading you to a life of poverty until you learn to bow to him? I'm telling you, you know, at some point we have to wake up and see what's going on. How God multiplied fish and bread and fed 4,000 people. At some point, we have to recognize what's going on. Is God multiplying what you got? Or do, are you taking in enough to feed 4,000, but ain't got nothing to show for it? Is he multiplying or dividing what you got? It could be that God is trying to get your attention. Does everybody see that now? So the first thing we have to do when we come to God is make up our mind that we're going to serve him. 
We can't do that and hold on to the world's way of thinking at the same time. Success is not derived from how much money you have in your bank account. You know, that's one of the things that we read in the book of Revelation that was the problem with the Laodicean church. They said, I am rich and have need of nothing. That was a church saying that. I am rich and I have need of nothing. And then, we, and then some of us in here, we say, well, I ain't rich. So I, that ain't me, Brother Bolton. <laughs> but that don't mean you don't have the mindset. Man, as soon as I get rich, I won't have need of nothing. And that's a million years away from here. If God love you. That's a million years away from here if God loves you. I say this. <laughs> you, you know, being in God's program, that, that's a whole different story. When you're out in the world, that little, all that little maneuvering you were doing, that might have worked. But when you give your life to the Lord and you start trying to live for him, now he put his, his foot in it. And the stuff that you used to do, that don't work anymore. All of the grinding you did out on the streets, and all, that don't work anymore. God don't care about how many raises you get. What's your raise in the kingdom of God? What's your salary there? Does everybody understand that? Because many of us, we look forward to our yearly evaluation so we can get the little 13, 15 cent raise an hour and already got it spent. Already got it spent. It's a proven fact that, that the natural mind has this thought process. The more I make, the more I'm going to spend. That, does everybody understand that now? Wisdom don't come with the amount of money that you make. Wisdom comes from God. And you could take a person just, you, you could take a person, they, they live in a, on a, 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 a menial a salary, and they just as happy and just as blessed and got more than somebody that's making double than they're making. Because when we're serving God, our priorities have to be in order. If our priorities in, aren't in order, we're going to miss it every single time. Every single time, brothers and sisters. We have to have our priorities in order. And <laughs> this generation, this generation, the selfish, love-grown-cold generation, is very hard for them to set things in the proper order that they're supposed to be in. Very hard, this is, the, the, the language I'm talking is a different language because this generation was not taught to crucify flesh. This generation didn't, wasn't raised with five, six, seven children beneath them and they knew how to make bottles at five years old for their little brother, little sister. That's not this generation. This generation despised their little siblings despise them because you taking food out of my mouth now instead of 10 pieces of candy I only get five that's this generation and so then this generation try to start living for the Lord and what happens they take the same mindset they're not sacrificing anything don't know how to sacrifice because they weren't raised to sacrifice they were born to hurt parents and because of that the parents made gods out of them and so what can they do if they God but worship themselves and try to get other people to worship them? Does everybody understand now? You have to understand what's born out of hurt. It don't go anywhere but downhill. Does everybody see now? That's what I love about God's word. It's timeless. It's, it's timeless. God was speaking to people today even back then, even before it got as worse as what we see it today. He was speaking to people today. Verse 25. It says, therefore, I say unto you. So everything we just covered from verse 19 to verse 24 is why he's saying the therefore. In other words, this is why I say unto you, Take no thought for whose life? 
Oh, but it's just the opposite now. I'm going to take no thought for your life, but for my life, I got to take thought. Who's going to think about me? Who's going to fend for me? Does everybody see that? So look at what he says. If you want to get to a place where you're not serving mammon and you can serve God with your whole heart, he's, I, I'm telling you, take no thought for your life. So in other words, what is the avenue that the devil uses to pull on me to get me to serve mammon? What does he do? He get me to think about my own life. Once the devil get me to thinking about my own life, I'm going to serve mammon. Does everybody see that now? Look what it says. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. And notice what he, the things that he uses. What car you shall drive? What house you going to live in? Who you going to marry? Is that what he says? He uses the basic essentials of life. So you know everything else is out the door. <laughs> Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor for yet for your body, what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. Everybody see that? Isn't that something now? He said there's more to your life. Listen, than what it takes to survive. Isn't that something now? Don't we need food to survive? And he says, so your life is more than your own survival. So quit fighting for yourself. And so how, how do I know I'm fighting? Why, why would he use food? That's, think, about what that, think about that now. That's the first thing he says. Take no thought for your life what you shall eat. Why does, he, why does he say that? Because people can't get finished eating breakfast before they're thinking about lunch. And can't get finished eating lunch before they're thinking about dinner. Still got food in their belly. And, and thinking about what they're going to eat next. And he's saying, don't take no thought for that. Don't think about those things. Those are the things that the devil uses to pull you into this natural realm. And when you get pulled into this natural realm, you can't serve God. Now you got to serve mammon. You know why? Because it takes money to buy food. <laughs> Does everybody see that now? It takes money. Does everybody see that? To buy a drink, to buy clothes. It, that takes money. So you may say, well, you know, what's wrong with eating food? You know, don't we have to eat food to survive? But how do you buy food? How do you get food? You buy it. And so if you're serving food, you're still serving mammon and the power that it has to buy things, even the essential, essential things of life. He's telling us to take no thought. Now, I, I want to just stop here. Now, that's the name of this message. Take no thought for your life, for your life. Now, you think about it now. This is at the beginning of his ministry. Not at the end, at the very beginning. Not, so if that's tough for us, you think about how it must have been for them at the beginning. He's telling them, take no thought for your life. Why? Because I'm going to require even more, much more than that when I get done stacking this stuff on. If you take thought for your life, you won't be willing to die for me when it comes time to give your neck to somebody's sword. So if you, it ain't nowhere in the world, on, on Saturday, you thinking about food and what you're going to eat, and on Sunday, somebody come knocking on your door asking you if you're a Christian and ready to kill you if you are, and you're ready to give your neck to them. No way. If you're thinking about food on Saturday, Sunday, you ain't ready to give your life to the Lord for, to lay it down for his sake. Does everybody understand that now? So when you think about it in that manner, then taking no thought for what we shall eat, that's not a big deal if I'm going to die tomorrow anyway. You know, a lot of people, when they on death row, they give them, uh, the, some states have it, where they give them whatever meal they choose. And, and you know what a lot of them do? They, they choose to skip over that. I'm not, I don't want to eat. Y'all still planning on killing me? Well, that's okay then. 
<laughs> Does everybody understand? I, I know if I was on death row, I wouldn't be concerned with that either. What do I care? Y'all got some freedom? Is that, is y'all serving that up? How about some parole? Y'all give me some parole. We don't know what that is. Well, you go find it. And don't you kill me until you, <laughs> until you <laughs> cook it for me. What does it matter what you're going to eat if you're dead? What does it matter what you're going to drink if you're dead? What does it matter what clothes you're going to wear if you're dead? The Lord don't care nothing about your outfits and how you put them together. He don't care nothing about you matching. Don't, that don't move him at all. You know how many clothes the Lord had on when they killed him? Zero. He was completely naked. He didn't ask nobody to cover him up. His mother was in that crowd. She hadn't seen him, seen him in that way for over 32 years, naked like that. But you know what he was doing while he was naked? In front of a whole crowd of people, he was praying for them. That was somebody that didn't take thought. He was praying for him. Not praying for himself. Lord, please cover my shield, my, my nakedness. How they gonna think I'm a prophet and I'm up here naked hanging on a tree? How they gonna think I'm the Messiah and they see all of my goodies? What none of that. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Oh, you want some salvation? Well, this day you'll be with me in paradise. That was somebody that wasn't taking thought. Does everybody see that now? He had a right to take thought. But he chose not to. You know why? Because he practiced what he preached. Everybody see now? So look at what it says. Verse 26, behold the fowls of the air. Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father does what? Feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? The question is, do you think you are? Most of us, we don't give birds a second thought. We don't give them, we don't give them a seven, second look. Just whatever, that's a bird. He's flying, so what? But you know what? The Lord said, and that's my creation, and I feed them. They ain't got to gather in barns. They don't have refrigerators. Don't ha they don't have any of that, and I feed them. It's going to be some little stupid worm poke his head out of the ground, and that bird, I've given them what they call bird's eye view. Half a mile in there, and they can see a little worm sticking their head out of the ground. And I call them to it. And here we are, <laughs> the pinnacle of God's creation. But we some, we some high-minded folks. But live like the birds are better than us. Does everybody understand that now? I, you know, what kind of saddle do the birds have? What kind of job do they have? Does everybody see now? Do they get raises? They get none of that. They just trust God. Does everybody see now? Look what it says. Which of you, by doing what? Everybody see that? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Everybody see? In other words, what are you going to do about your own life anyway? Most of us have something about ourselves we like to change. He said, but which of you, by taking thought, is able to change it? Look what it says. And why take ye thought? Everybody, you see the, the theme here? He said that three times already. Take thought. Why, and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They tall not, neither do they spin. Does everybody see what they're saying there? Why does it use the word tall? What does that word tall mean? To work and worry. Now let's think about, the translation is this, brothers and sisters. 
the lilies don't have a big closet full of clothes and they're going standing trying to figure out what they're going to wear. They're not putting on outfits and getting in the mirror and turning and looking to see how it's fitting. They don't toil. That's what he's saying. They're not concerned with how outfits look on them. God dresses them. Does everybody see that now? And then, then we have to think of it this way. How many of us toil? Look at what it says. They toil not, neither do they what? Isn't that something now? Now how many women spin? Does everybody understand that? Does everybody understand that? How many women spin? How many of you doing this, looking in the mirror, trying to make sure I'm, I'm trying to just be straight? Yes. Going to the house of the Lord, got to look my best. <laughs> and the inside just is raggedy. Do this spiritually. Does everybody understand that? that? Do this with the word. This is your mirror. Toil in it. Does everybody understand? Yeah, that's what you're supposed to be toiling in. So look at what it says now. Verse 29, And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, everybody see, who clothed the grass? God does which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, you, O ye of little faith? So he's, now he's given us something to think about. These things that we do, looking in the mirror, going spend five minutes trying to pick out an outfit. Then we put it on. We look at ourselves in the mirror for another 10 minutes. And then we think, no, that don't. No, that don't look right. I don't feel led with this outfit. Let me take this off and put this on. He says that's, that's a, a, a sure sign of a lack of faith. That's a sign of a lack of faith. Does everybody see that now? You know what makes people concerned with how they look on the outside? Because the inside is raggedy and dirty. And they're using the outside to try to make up and cover up the junk that's not right. What do you think happened to Adam and Eve? Why did they even know to go sow some fig leaves together? They were trying to cover up the darkness and death that had entered into them. And people to this day still sowing fig leaves, putting on clothes. And you know what God did? He came with skins, with coats of skin for them. He said, no, if you're going to cover yourself, it's got to be in my righteousness. It's going to be what I provide. So close your, listen, the Bible tells us to clothe ourselves with humility. Humility ain't standing in the mirror 30 minutes before we go somewhere. Humility just putting on clothes. Looks like it still fit. Thank the Lord. Does everybody understand? That's all humility is concerned about. Is the tag in the back? Okay, well, it's good then. <laughs> Does everybody understand? Yeah, humility don't think it's cute. Yeah, it, it don't think it's cute at all. It don't think it's anything to look at, really. No matter how pretty it is, it don't think it's anything to look at. So it, it's not trying to get everything straight because when I walk in, I'm going to make a, a grand entrance. Yeah, yeah in your mind. <laughs> Does everybody understand that? The Bible says that's from a lack of faith. Look at verse 31. Therefore, do what now? Do what now? Isn't that something? Y'all see the theme there? All this requires people to take thought, to think about things they should not be thinking about. And we wonder why we have such a hard time serving God. 
How are we going to serve God when we're thinking of ourselves more? Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things, things do the Gentiles seek. In other words, the unbelievers. For your heavenly Father knoweth. Everybody see that? And so what else is that letting us know? When we take thought and we're doing all these things and we're caught up in the way the world is doing things, we're acting like God is ignorant. And, and, and yet we still try to serve and worship him. How are you going to worship God when you're treating him like he don't know? When he, he, he apparently is ignorant of your needs. You see how you can't fool God? If you think God is ignorant of your needs and don't care about what you're eating, what you're drinking, and your clothes, then how can you worship him? Your worship is in vain when you don't completely trust God. Look what he says. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have what? That ye have what? Need. Need. He knows what you need. And he knows that you have need of what? All these things. He, un he recognizes them as a need. I know you need food. You need drink. You need clothes. But don't you think about it. Now this is at the beginning of his ministry. And you know, we probably could read right here, and many follow him no more. <laughs> you done lost your mind. What are you talking about don't think about what I'm going to eat and what I'm going to drink? How am I going to serve you if I ain't got no strength? <laughs> so let's read the last part of that verse. Your heavenly father. I love that term. Your heavenly father. Father. You everybody see that now? What does he do? He knoweth that ye have need. Now I have to, I'm trying to stress that for a reason. That ye have need of all these things. And then verse 33, what? But. When you hungry, but. When you're thirsty, but. When you're naked, but. You get a pass? Look at what he tells us to do. But what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What things? Food. Drink, clothes, what shall they be added? It comes with the kingdom of God. These things just come with the territory. Your food, your drink, your clothes, they come with the territory. I can prove it, brothers and sisters. When I was living in Tulsa, and this was after Brother Junior had ordained me to be the pastor of the church in Derrida that he was over when I was a little boy. I didn't, all I had was jeans and clothes to work out in the yard with. The Lord had touched somebody's heart on the way to Louisiana. I stopped at the store and somebody bought me a whole wardrobe of clothes to preach in. I wasn't going to complain. I'd have got right up and preached in my work clothes, my jeans, whatever. They, they didn't look like they were appropriate for standing behind a podium. But I was willing to do that. And the Lord provided. It was an unexpected blessing. That's how I know if we will seek the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, it's really added. God adds these things. But you know what? When we're too busy trying to add them ourselves, we're taking glory from God. 
How in the world are we going to see a miracle when we become our own miracle? When our, own, when our testimony is, I figured it out, Lord. <laughs> Does everybody see you? I ain't got to figure out nothing. I'll let you handle that. I'm going to just keep seeking your face. You'll take care of the rest. Everybody see that? So, in other words, what he's saying is you can't serve God and mammon. If you serve in mammon, you're working for food. You're working for clothes. You're working for drink. But if you seek God and his righteousness, what happens? He adds it. That's where the miracles flow in. It's just added. There's a testimony of a, a, a young man. He's deceased now. He lived to be an older man and died. He went through somebody's prayer line. Uh, uh, it was a man giving this testimony. It was his childhood friend. And this, this something happened to the fellow where he had ended up getting a glass eye. You know, and one of his eyes got knocked out and they put a glass eye in. And he went through this prayer line. And it was a lady up there praying for people. Now she didn't know the fellow. She didn't know him at all. He was a little boy. She didn't know him. And she, she asked him, what do you want? I, I want to be saved. I want the Lord to, to heal my body. Something was going on in his body, but I want to give my life to the Lord. And she looked and she could see that something was wrong with his eye, but she didn't know it was a glass eye. And he asked, she asked him, can you, can, is everything okay with that eye? He said, no, ma'am. He said, well, do you want me to pray for your eye? Yes, ma'am. So she prayed for the eye and it was a glass eye. And from that moment until the day of his death, he could see out of that glass eye. You can go online and look up pictures for him. Many doctors, many doctors came to see him. And they wrapped that other eye as tight as they could, made sure that a whole bunch of stuff was on top of it. And he could, he could read their driver's licenses. They were bringing him material to read that there was no way he'd have memorized. And he could see out of that glass eye. But he didn't go up there to get prayed for the glass eye. He wanted to give his life to the Lord. And you know, he could take the eye out. God didn't do a creative miracle where he made another eye, like made it attached to his nerves. He, the, the friend was saying when we were little boys, even after he could read, he would take the eye out and roll it around the table. The man was saying, we played jokes on people. We'd be out at a restaurant, and, the, and the, the waiter would come up and see the eye sitting on the table. You know how little boys can be honorary like that. But you know what? <laughs> he put it right back in and read his menu. <laughs> so does everybody see how we miss out on miracles? Because we're trying to do stuff ourselves. We're seeking the natural things instead of seeking the spiritual things. That's what he's talking about. Seek the spiritual things. One day, the Lord's disciples came up to him and they asked him, Lord, are you hungry? You need to eat something. You, you got to be hungry. And he said, my meat is to do the will of my father. That's my food. That's what satisfies me. Isn't that something now? Look what it says, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everybody see that? And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Isn't that something? Isn't it a good news that we don't have to add these things ourselves? That we no longer have to toil and spin? We don't have to figure things out? All we have to do is seek ye first. First. In other words, have priority. Now, here's the thing. None of the rest of what we do for God makes sense if we don't find ourselves in verse 33. It don't make God no, make no sense to lay down your life for God if you're not seeking him first. If he's not your priority, why would I lay down my life? Does that make any sense? No, not at all. What are you talking about? I'm just here to worship you. 
I ain't say nothing about dying for you. Everybody see now. Verse 34. Take therefore, what? No thought. Y'all see the theme there? Take no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, whatever evil you're going to run into tomorrow, let that be tomorrow. Don't let the devil worry you about what might be tomorrow. Don't let the devil worry you about what you're going to eat for lunch. You don't know if you're going to live to see lunchtime. Deal with your stuff now. What you got going on now? Am I right with God? Okay, thank you. Everybody see that now? And all we're doing, we just pile stuff on and worry and worry and pile and worry and pile and worry. And that makes us more anxious to get out there and make stuff happen. I, Lord, I got to make it happen. If I don't make it happen, who's going to do it? Does everybody see that now? Now, let me explain this. Before we close, this tells us, what's the first part of that verse say? Take therefore what? No thought. Now let's really break that down. It tells us, and that's the name of this message, take no thought for your life. The implication is this, and every, again, everything that's in the Bible and the way it's worded is in there for a reason. If I... Let's think about it this way. If I take something, that means it's got to be handed to me. Does everybody understand that now? So the question is, who's handing you those thoughts? Who's putting in your mind your next meal? Who's putting in your mind your next drink, your, the next outfit that you're going to wear? He says, don't take those thoughts. That means somebody is giving you those thoughts. It's not just your survival mode kicking in. There is an entity there that is purposely bombarding your mind but listen, even the essentials of life, but you don't recognize it because you think it's just survival. But that's just how slick the devil is. Listen, the devil knows you have need of these things as well. But I can tell you something, God don't ever give you something for you to worry about. That's the devil's job. So even the essentials of life, your thought process, is the devil bringing you those thoughts. And the Lord tells us, don't take them. Cast them down. Because it is designed to get you to think about yourself. And to serve yourself. And serve mammon. And not serve God. Isn't that something? Let's think about this. How many of you have ever been out to eat at a restaurant that had a waiter and had a waiter or a waitress wait on you? How many of y'all's waiters or waitresses sat down at your table and ate some of your food? Raise your hand. Come on, get them up. They, they sat down, you ordered the food, you paid for it, and they sat down with you, and they ate your food. How many of you ever had to worry about that? You know why? Because while they were on the job, they were not there to serve themselves. They were there to serve you. They couldn't work their jobs and serve themselves at the same time. You think some of them are not hungry? You don't think they get hungry serving other people, smelling all that good food that they bring into you? But they are servers. And you are the priority. They'll serve you first. Does everybody understand that now? How many of you would like, let's say, let's say, for instance, they don't sit down at the table and eat with you. How many of you would like to peek through the window back there and they back there putting your food together and they taking snacks from somewhere else? You, you do exactly what you do if they sat down at the table eating your food. I'm, let me talk to your manager. Because something don't seem right. You serving me and you? 
I'm God. <laughs> Does everybody understand now? And so if you know when you go to a place and it's supposed to be about you getting served, you think God don't know that? It's something in you that know when a waiter come up to you serving you, they're supposed to be serving you, not themselves. How would you like if the waiter come up to you and they serve you food and they say, man, I, that look good. I, you know, I, I'm thinking about trying that myself. And they just standing there mouth watering just looking at your food. Yeah, heaven laughs as well when we serve God with our mouth watering, wanting to serve ourselves. We're not supposed to, brothers and sisters. We serve God and let him and his ministering angels come to our rescue for these things. Does everybody understand that now? Let's put it this way. How many of you ever bought a surprise for somebody? You are just thought of something that you wanted to give or you were surprising them. And your heart was just filled with joy. Man, I can't wait to see how you take this. I can't wait to see your eyes light up and your face and your smile when you find out what I've done for you. Only to have somebody give it away. Only to have, find out they knew about it. Only to have them tell you, I already bought that. How many of you ever had something like that happen? So do you see how we take the joy of the Lord away from him when he wants to serve his people, when he wants to provide? And he say, hey, hey, I come, I, I'm bringing, just like I said in my word, all these things will be added. No, that's okay, Lord, I already, I already figured out what I'm going to eat. That's okay, Lord, I already figured out what I'm going to drink. That's okay, Lord, I got it. You see how we take his joy away when we do that? Yeah, he wants to see those expressions as well. He wants to hear the testimony. Look, I didn't, I didn't have any food in the refrigerator. Look at what God did. I woke up one morning and food was already there. And after a while, God can get tired of us ruining his surprise party. And he'll just let us just continue to worship ourselves. He'll just let us say, okay, so you got it. You got it. And you know what happens? That's a life with no testimonies. That's a life that don't think God is doing anything because I, I got to handle it. And all we can thank God, thank God for is giving us the strength to go out and, and toil and spin. Does everybody understand that now? I tell you, God's still working miracles. But we got to let him work them. Does everybody understand that? <laughs> and we got to be willing to put in the place to work them. Does everybody understand now? I tell you, brothers and sisters, God worked miracles. Uh, this building that we're sitting in is a miracle. Does everybody understand now? Yeah, we didn't have to toil and spend for it. God just put it in our laps. Does everybody understand? So, brothers and sisters, we have to be willing to allow God to be God in our lives so we can worship him. That's, that's the reason why we worship him, because we experience these things being added. They're added. And that makes our life living for him all the more sweeter. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this word that you've spoken to us today. And God, we ask that you will bless it. Anoint it, Lord, be in our hearts. Help us, Lord, not to ever forget the things that we've learned today. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we've toiled, for the times that we've provided for ourselves and removed your fatherhood from our lives. Lord, help us to look upon you and to depend upon you for everything, Lord. Not just our strength, Lord, but for even the necessities of life. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we worship you for all of the things that you've done and even all of the things that we don't know you were working behind the scenes. So, Lord, right now we ask that you forgive us. Right now, Lord, we give you room in our lives. 
to move how you see fit. Forgive us, Lord, for being our own God. So right now, Lord, we make room for you. We ask that you be God in our lives. And we'll take, Lord, whatever food you have for us. We'll take whatever drink you have for us, Lord. We remove our own taste in life. The food, the drink, the raiment, Lord, whatever you want to clothe us with would be satisfactory to us. Thank you, Lord, for taking care of us and for loving us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, that's all now. We'll go back to the back and we'll have a little discussion about what we've heard. So right now we're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.